uh, you picked a good Sunday. Uh, we are uh, in, in store for week two, our second installment of a series that we started last week uh, entitled Losing My Religion. And the prayer behind this series is that uh, all of us would confront the religiosity that lives on the inside of us. The, all of us that call ourselves Jesus followers would say, I'm going to choose the ways of Jesus over religiosity. And uh, our ultimate desire in this is to, to, to look a little bit more like Jesus, to love a little bit more like Jesus, to have an aroma that smells a little bit more like Christ, not, not the aroma of politics, not the aroma of what the world wants us to look like, not the aroma of religion, but the aroma of Jesus Christ. And so uh, today, if you have your Bibles, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 26. Uh, we're going to start there. We're going to uh, read a few verses today, and uh, we're going to jump around. And I am uh, extra excited today for what God wants to speak to us about. Matthew chapter 26, uh, I'm going to uh, read uh, verse um, uh, 26 to, to 29 uh, this morning. This is Jesus um, at the Last Supper here. It says, and as they were eating, Jesus took some bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the remission of sins. But I say to you, and this is interesting because this jumped out to me this week, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So this at this Last Supper, he says, I'm not gonna drink this, this covenantial drink with you, this, this, this wine, until we drink it anew together in our Father's kingdom. So let's go to, to John 19 now. John 19, John 19, this is Jesus hanging on the cross. This is just a few short days after that Last Supper had taken place. And in, in verse 28, Jesus hanging on the cross says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there. And when they filled a sponge with some sour wine, they put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. It's interesting. The Last Supper, Jesus tells us he is not going to drink of this new covenant wine, this, 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 which is indicative of the blood of Jesus until he drinks it anew. Here at the cross, they offer Jesus sour wine and he actually takes this sour wine. And it says, after he took this sour wine, he then cried out, it is finished, as he gave up his spirit. One more passage of scripture from the teachings of Jesus. Matthew 5, verse 6, very famous passage of scripture for those of us who are Jesus followers. It says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. I wanna make this statement. I, I, I believe, I, I know this. We all have a, a, a thirst for something. All of us have a, a, a thirst, a desire for something. And all of us go to different wells at different times. And my prayer today is that whatever well that you might have found yourself, that you would choose the well of the living water that is Jesus Christ. For he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled, meaning every other thing that we go to drink of does not quench what only God can fill. So here's the, the dilemma I believe we live in today. 
in the American church, I believe religion has created a spiritual dehydration. And so many of us are parched. Many of us are, are, are we walk into church gatherings and we leave the exact same. And I don't think God intended it to look this way. And so today we are going to drink of this living water as we break religion. And I wanna to speak to you today and I, I wanna focus on the topic of judgmentalism. And the title of our, our conversation, our talk today out of scripture is breaking judgmentalism. I'll drink to that. Some of you are like, where are we going with this? Oh, I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show you that there's something that we need to be drinking. Breaking judgmentalism. I'll drink to that. So Father, we love you. God, I thank you for what you have in store in this place today. God, I pray for every person under the sound of my voice today, watching online or in this room, that they would hear you, that they would see you, God, for the voice of a stranger they will not recognize. And so Holy Spirit, would you illuminate scripture? Would you point us to Jesus? God, would you break down the walls of religion in our life and in this community? Help us to see Jesus so clearly. God, I thank you that you are the ultimate judge. And we are commanded to love. And Father, as recipients of your love, of your grace, of your forgiveness, the fact that Jesus has taken all of the judgment that we deserve. God, we stand, we sing, we approach you with gratitude today, thankful, thankful for this ultimate sacrifice. God, I pray that you would speak to every single one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. Uh, anybody been to a uh, restaurant recently? Okay, few of us, many of us, since they have reopened. I, I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, we greatly, my wife and I, we greatly miss the restaurants when they were temporarily shut down. My wife and I, we are foodies to the core, okay? So meaning um, we try to stay fit and active uh, and work out um, several times throughout the week simply so that we can eat, okay? That is, that is why we do it. It is, it, it is not for beautiful physique. It is so that we can consume an enormous amount of calories a couple of times a week for food that we absolutely love. But it's interesting, like, like, okay, so all of us have been to a restaurant. Those of you online, I'm sure you've been to a restaurant. What is the first thing um, that a, a, a waiter or a waitress will ask you when they come to take your order? What can I get you to drink? Right, and then depending on what you're thirsty for, you will order a drink. Now, after you, you get your drink and you have some time to look over the menu, you will then convey to them what you are, are going to uh, indulge in and enjoy uh, as your meal. Now, I find it interesting that as we even look at the Last Supper here, what does Jesus do first? He gives them the bread. And then he gives them the drink or the wine. Just a short reminder for us, the kingdom of God is opposite of this world. It, it, it looks nothing like the, 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 the world that we live in today. The kingdom of God is countercultural to what a lot of us see and consume. And then you, you can go and you can study, you can look through scripture and see so many uh, examples of the kingdom of God being the opposite of this world. Now, um, there's places though that, that, that you go that may not have your drink. What do you mean? I'll give you an example. Like when I go to the gym, okay? When I go to the gym, the gym does not have my specific pre-workout drink that I like to consume. So what do I do? I, I bring my own drink with me. The challenge today in our church is, in our churches, not, not here at Lighthouse, of course, just gonna, gonna say generalization, okay? The challenge with today's church is we come into our church gatherings dry and we leave dry. At some point, as we mature in our faith, we realize that, you know what? I'm not just coming to receive some water today. I'm coming bringing some water today. I'm coming filled up from the week. 
I've consumed this week. I've eaten the word of God this week. I've drank some living water this week. I've seen the testimonies and the miracles of God this week. I can't wait to get to the house of God. Which is so countercultural than most of our churches look like. I, I, I'm going to tell you a full caveat. The pastor has fully cannonballed off the deep end here. I, I, I am, am, am growing so tired of, of, of seeing people continue to struggle to walk in dry, to walk in empty, and then to leave our church gatherings the same way they walked in. I actually don't believe that's the, what God intends for us in our gatherings. And so sometimes you gotta bring your own, like, like church is not a talent show. Like you didn't just come here to watch some good looking people sing some really awesome songs. You don't come here to watch this, this preacher who looks like he's 12 scream. You came here to have an encounter with Jesus. And until we can get to this point and break down religion and say, I am where I am. I am struggling. I may come in dry. I may have some extra water this week. I can't wait to get to the house of God. So as we, 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 we look to this, it's like, even in worship, like, I love, I, I'm, a, I'm a hand raiser, I'm a crier, I'm a swayer. Y'all see me? There's no shame in my game. I watch some of the people worship, and I can tell, I'm going to tell you this right now, I can tell by the hunger and the thirst in which certain people worship from the life that they've been delivered from. Like, like, some of us in this room, like following Jesus has actually potentially cost us our life. Not, not, not here in the States, of course, but some of us who may have come from maybe a different country, who may have been disowned by their family, they're gonna come in here and know that it has cost them everything. And so they are incredibly grateful for Jesus. We got a lot to learn, church. It's like, ah, I'm not going to lift my hand. I don't feel like it today. I, I, don't, I don't feel like singing a song today. Listen, there is a point in our relationship with God that we must choose to worship him past our feelings. I will bless the Lord, oh my soul. Why are you so downcast? There has to be a choice, church, that we make week in and week out that it's not about walking through religious duties and religious check boxes and we did the little Sunday thing and we did the church thing so I should be good, but now we're leaving our church gatherings the same that we walked in, struggling with the same things that we've been struggling with for the last 15 years. I think God would have a lot to say to us. Like religion will want us to approach church as simply that, a, a check box. But when you are in such an, an intimate relationship with Jesus, it's like, I, I can't wait to get to the house of God today. I, I, I can't wait to get to the house of the Lord to see what he's going to do. There's going to be captives that are set free. There are going to be prodigals that are coming home. This I can't wait to get to the house of God. Some of us know it's, it's the challenge, right? Because of all of our comfort, and all of the things that religion has made church out to be, it's like, you know, following Jesus, I say yes to Jesus, it's like the get into heaven card and I'm good. Church, we are commissioned with this great commission essentially to establish the kingdom of God here on this earth. So Christianity is not, I've surrendered my life to Jesus, I've checked that box off, I will one day get into heaven and I'm gonna continue to live my same life. Following Jesus is a complete surrender of our life. He actually wants to completely break down and destroy our lives in what culture and the world has made it so that he will rebuild us in his image. <laughs> I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty for the presence of God. I'll drink to that. I, I, I'm, I'm thirsty for a great move of God in this land. I'll drink to that. And what am I drinking? Oh, I'm drinking of this living water. So at some point, church, I, I, I want to encourage you. Like, like, let, me, let me show it to you this way. Um, 
You remember Jesus when he was tempted in the desert. Matthew 4, remember Matthew 3 when Jesus was baptized. Immediately after that, he was taken to this desert. In this desert, he would be tempted by the devil. For 40 days and for 40 nights, he fasted, he did not eat, he did not drink, and the tempter came and tempted him in a few different areas. Now, it's interesting to me that the scripture actually says that at the end of this, at the end of this time, the scripture says, and Jesus was hungry. Didn't say that he was thirsty. Let's go a little bit deeper. Remember when the devil tempted him? What did he tempt him in? He tempted him to turn the stones into bread, which has to lead us to the question, why didn't scripture say that Jesus was thirsty after those 40 days and 40 nights? And why didn't the devil tempt him in the area of water? I'll tell you why, because he is the living water. He has his own reserve. He is the reservoir of water in which all of life flows from. And so the devil knew that he could not tempt him in his identity in who he was because he was the living water. This is why many of us, we, we, we will fall, we will fall and we will take the drink of whatever is offered to us. Like the devil doesn't even have to try hard anymore. All of us have a drink and an appetite for something. I think, let me say this, this might be the better way of saying it. Thirsty people will drink anything of, from anyone. Thirsty people, you ever met a thirsty person? Thirsty for some attention? Thirsty for some compliments? Thirsty to make it about them? Thirsty for affirmation? And so they will, they will consume, they will eat, and they will drink wherever they can get it from. But they're still, they're still thirsty because there is only one that is living water. That's why when we look at scripture and we, we even look to that example in Matthew 4 of Jesus, he is our living water. It's why I can go into a dry land because there is a deep reservoir of water, of living water on the inside of my being. That's why a pastor will say, we have to be reading our Bibles, church. It's, it's not like, a, I, we get to be reading our Bibles, church. But it's like, ah, when it's convenient, when I have time, or when the pastor reads five to eight verses on Sunday, that's my word. Come on, my prayer is to lead you to be self-feeders in your own relationship with Jesus. That's breaking the walls of religion. You don't just come here to get a word from a pastor. You come here to encounter the living word. So, but we, 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 we have a challenge with this. And we, um, I think religion has made this hard. And I think re religion has made this in a way um, that has caused us to come into church and to leave church exactly the same, struggling with the same things. And it's because um, we're, we're scared many times of being judged for what we're really going through. I'll give you an example. I got a fridge back here. Anybody thirsty? Anybody thirsty? I'm a little parched. Anybody thirsty? You could use a drink. Let me see what we got in the fridge today. Perrier, that's that high-end water. This is my drink of choice most days, Coca-Cola Zero with the cherry. Shout that out. We got some Coors Light, the mountains are blue. Thought it'd be quiet on that one. We got some San Pellegrino, that's even more Gucci water. All right. So I asked you a question, are you thirsty? And many of us who are watching this, this is like, I told you I'm gonna poke you in this series a little bit. Our, our religiosity is being confronted right now because you're looking at this or you're watching online and you're thinking to yourself in the chat, pastor pulled out a beer on the stage. Like that's what you're thinking. You're, oh my, oh my, oh my Lord in heaven almighty. The pastor has pulled out and, and some of us will not be able to get past this demonstration because there's a beer on the stage. Now, I told you I was thirsty. I haven't even made a decision 
on what I'm going to drink yet, but we're, being ju- we're judging based on the options that are up here. And this is what we do in Christianity. We judge one another based on the options or the temptations that they have before they've even made their decision to drink. And at some point, many of us come into church with a a fake version of ourselves. A fake version, meaning, um, that's not the Coors Light, people. (laughs) That's the lightly sugared water. Need a little extra sugars right now. I'm feeling a little depleted. But at some point, many of us come into church and what happens is we are scared of being judged by somebody else because we have this notion that church is this judgmental group of people and we're never really honest about what we're going through. And so we wonder why we gather and we put out this fake version. How how are you doing? Oh, I'm blessed, brother. Hey, I'm wonderful, sister. How are things going? Oh, I'm, I am doing so well. Things are good. And everything stays at the surface. And I'm, I am tired of our churches staying at the surface, coming in, faking like things are good, and leaving with the same issues. At some point, we have to come and say, God, here's who I am. Here's all that I'm going through. Here's what I'm really struggling with, and I need you to heal me up. It's why I look forward to our gatherings on Sunday, because there are some people coming in that are going through some very real things, and what if this concept that God would only meet us at our level, that we're able to be real with what we're going through? I I heard a pastor say, God won't heal the fake you. Like who we pretend to be. At some point, let's get honest with ourselves and where we're at in our struggles and say, God, I need you. That's the kind of church that Lighthouse is gonna be. Come one, come all, just as you are. There's water available for everybody. God can heal anybody. Come and drink of this living water. We, we're, we're, quick to, we're quick to tell people what they're not before we even tell them who he is. <laughs> you're this and you're that, and we judge them based on what we're seeing. And at some point there has to be a passion that rises up on the inside of us that is stronger than looking at one another and judging the stuff that we're going through and say, let me tell you about this Jesus because it is this Jesus that can heal you at the core, that will heal you at the root issues. Like, like, let me say it this way. You can write this down, it's a long point. I think it's coming up on the screens. Um, You can tweet it later. Here it is. We all have a thirst for something. All of us. Not just talking about, because you you, you can assume that we're talking about, oh, he put out a beer, so he must be talking about alcohol. I'm talking, all of us can thirst for something. We have our things. But if we can be honest about why we thirst for that thing, it will allow Jesus to heal us at our roots. What, what, What does that mean? Because a lot of us like to go at, and this is most of our churches and the messages that we preach, they go at all these leaf issues and we never get to the root. (laughs) And I'm, I'm much more interested with getting to the root of things and allow Jesus to heal us from our roots. Because if our roots, if we are planted in the house of the Lord, what's the scripture say? We will flourish. But, but we're not honest about what it really is. Like I'll I'll share, share it to you this way. Like for me, One of the struggles I've had to deal with, and it's still a temptation for me to deal with in life, is to please people. Like the affirmation of somebody else. I've done some really, 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 really stupid things in my life because I was trying to please somebody else. It's a thirst. And so I can say, well, yeah, I struggle with pleasing people, but why do I struggle with caring so much about what people say? You gotta go all the way back to this 12 
to this 13, to this 14, to this 15-year-old boy who was always the new kid at school, and all this kid wanted was somebody to sit with at a, t a lunch table and share lunch with. So here he is all these years later dealing with the same thing because of a brokenness he experienced all the way back in junior high. So it wasn't until I realized that God wants to heal me completely at my roots. He is my living water. He is the one that I desire to please. He is the one that I'm filling my life with, that the approval and the acceptance of other people has kind of diminished because there's a greater approval that I have received, and it is the approval of Jesus Christ. So we, we, we have to be honest, church, about where we're at and the issues and the struggles that we're going through. Meaning, my hunger and my thirst has transitioned in life from receiving it from other people, and now, as Matthew 5 tells us, there's a deeper hunger and a deeper thirst that I have, and it is for righteousness. But I had to allow God to heal me up and be honest and be honest about where I was about what I'm dealing with. I'm gonna ask the band to come out, I'm gonna close. I told you, we, we read scriptures earlier, I'm gonna get to it, it's gonna get good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you this. This Last Supper, Jesus, he, he, he pours out some wine, gives some bread, he pours out some wine, and, and he says to, 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 to take this and consume this. This is a, a new covenant drink. This is, this is um, representative of, of my blood covering all the stuff of old that we all cannot add up to. And so he, he, he pours his disciples this drink. But then in, in, in verse 29, again, this, this jumped out to me. He says, but I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Okay, so he shares this moment, but then he tells him he's not going to drink of this. Let's go one, one chapter later. You guys doing okay? Let's go Matthew 27. One, one chapter later, Matthew 27. Uh, verse 32 to 34, this is the King Jesus on the cross. It says, now as the time came, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, the place of a skull, they gave him, notice now, sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he tasted it, when it touched his lips, he would not drink it. Okay, interesting. So let, let, let me just take you a little bit deeper. When somebody would be crucified, meaning they were going to take this beating and be hung on a cross. They were offered this mixture, this mixture of wine and this mixture of gall. And what this gall would do is it would numb and mask all the pain that they are about to experience. Okay, so they would give this to people who, who were about to be, be killed, very brutal death. They would consume this so that the pain that they were experiencing kind of dissolve. I'm going to tell you one of the things that God is exposing in our lives during this COVID season, the gall that we're drinking. The stuff that we are drinking to mask all the pain that we're experiencing. And then something happens over the last year where we can't necessarily hide the gall that we're drinking anymore because we're locked in our homes around people. And now people are aware of the goal that we're drinking to numb the pain that we're experiencing. I'll tell you something, church, pain is a good thing. We actually need to embrace the pain. Just, just, just pause on this really quick. Like, like Jesus, he didn't drink the goal because he wanted to feel all of the pain pain of the sins of you and I. He refused to numb the pain that he was about to experience. But many of us, the reason we never heal up 
is because religion has taught us in some way that if we can just somehow mask and hide the pain that we're experiencing and, and numb it down with whatever it is, whatever that goal is that you're drinking, or masking, and Jesus today wants to set you free. No, like I, I mean it, He wants to set you free of the goal you've been consuming because it was the reason he refused the goal was to take your pain, your shame, your guilt, your sickness, your illness. He wanted to feel all of that so that you don't have to live in it. But this is how our Christianity and religion works today. Oh, it's painful. Like Ronnie, if, if I'm lifting weights with Ronnie and I quit the moment something gets painful, what's gonna happen? A whole lot of nothing. Because I'm not willing to embrace the pain that it's going to take for growth. And the reason most of us are stuck in our spiritual journey is because we're avoiding pain by the goal we're consuming. And God wants us to embrace the very thing that we're running from. So stop hiding, church of Jesus Christ. Come out of hiding and experience this living water. I'll say it this way. In order to fulfill our God-given purpose, we need to embrace the pain. Embrace the pain. It, it, religion does this because here's what religion will do. Religion will look to magnify the pain of somebody else to dull the pain that they're experiencing. Oh, so so-and-so They've been drinking a whole lot of beers. They're, 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 they're drinking themselves out of their mind. They don't seem to be coherent. We, we can come to church and many of us over consuming maybe something to numb and dull the pain away because we're not dealing with what's really going on down in here. I wanna tell you, Jesus wants to heal you at your core, but what we like to do is if we were to realize that this fake sugar is also bad for us too. <laughs> this fake sugar is also bad for our insides. But somehow in Christianity, we said this fake sugar is somehow more acceptable in masking our pain than this can of beer. But both are actually hurting us. And what religion likes to do, Coca-Cola likes to say to the Blue Mountains, you're destroying somebody's life. It's your fault, it's your fault. And we never deal with and address the pain of ourselves. So church, as long as we keep playing this religious game and we just keep saying, oh, they've got issues, they've got issues, they've got issues, they're not well, they're not well. No, 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 it's the plank in my eye. And I need Jesus to heal me up. So until we can stop playing this religious game of casting judgment upon one another based on our struggles, causing us to walk into church faking it, saying this isn't a time to fake it till you make it. It's bad theology. Approach God just as you are in the presence of God and allow Him to heal you at your core. I told you we were gonna go a little deeper. Let's go John 19. You guys doing okay? John 19, 28 to 29. Jesus on this cross. He, he's now he's refused the goal with the sour wine. What happens now? And this 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 wrecked me this week. I'm gonna tell you, this this wrecked me in a crazy way this week. It says after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished that the scripture might be fulfilled, what did he say? He said, I thirst. It's the only time in scripture he says that. That him personally is thirsty. So he says, I thirst, and it says, now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there. And they filled this sponge with sour wine. <laughs> they put it on hyssop, and they put it to his mouth. And once he received it, the sour wine mixture, he actually drank this one. He said, it is finished. And he gave up his spirit. Just think for a moment. 
And let's go back to Exodus. And this Passover that was taking place, basically God told his people to do a few certain things in their homes and to not come out of their homes because there was basically death that was going to sweep through their land if they did not obey the things that God told them to do. Very specific here, Exodus 12, 22. It says, and you shall take a bunch of hyssop, <laughs> there it is, dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the intel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of this door or out of this house until morning. So the, 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 their, their instructions were to take the blood of a lamb. Once they have the blood of the lamb, they were to take this hyssop out of this blood basin, dip the hyssop in the blood basin and put it on their doorposts. They were instructed to put one stripe on each side of their doorpost and one at the top of the doorpost. Could this be a metaphor and a picture of the cross? If we remember him being the perfect spotless blood of the lamb whose arms was outstretched on a cross who was dripping blood from the sides of his hand the doorpost whose face and head was bleeding with this crown of thorns the blood from the top of the door as he was offered this mixture of sour wine with hyssop hyssop is indicative of cleansing you can go and you can look to scripture and scripture will tell us that in psalm 51 7 he says purge me with hyssop and i shall be clean wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. So where are you going with this? Why? The question we have to come back to is, why did Jesus drink that sour wine? How does wine get sour? It's either mixed with something or it's grown, grown old. You know what the Holy Spirit spoke to me this week? He said, Kevin, not only did I die for the sins of humanity, but I took the sour wine of old, the sour wine of religion, and I drank that so that all may be made new. Are you not grateful for Jesus? And do you believe this same God that stretched his arms out on a cross for you, that was laid in a tomb, that was resurrected from the dead, has the power to heal us at the core of what we're really walking through. Like he wants to heal us up. Like, like I, I'm ready to get back to uncomfortable church. Like I'm ready to get back to church where altars are filled with people weeping at the altar of Jesus Christ and ministry is taking place. Like I'm, I'm, I'm tired of playing games, church. You're, you're tired of the Christian karaoke. And we're weary and we're burnt out on this religion stuff. And I just wanna say, we will be that church that is unafraid to go near the messiness and help people in their real struggles. But we have to be honest. We gotta say, I need Jesus. I need some prayer. I need some anointing on my life. I need somebody to agree with me. I need to be healed up at the core. I gotta stop drinking this gall. And this gall that I'm drinking is masking the pain. It's only masking what I really need to be set free and healed from. Would you allow Jesus to heal you? I'm gonna do something different today. I want you to be bold. If you're, you're saying, I, I need to be healed up. You're saying, Pastor, I, I need to be healed up. Would you throw your hand up right now throughout this room? You say, I need to be healed. Come on, stand to your feet throughout this room. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to do something crazy. I'm going to ask you to come to the altar today. I want to lay hands on you. I want to pray in agreement with you. If you're watching online right now and you're saying, I could use some prayer, come on, the Spirit of God can still work through some interwebs and they can meet you right where you're at. And we got some people that want to 
pray with you, that want to agree with you. And so if you're saying, would you pray, would you pray with me? I want to ask you to be so bold. Step out of your seat. Meet me right here at the front. I want to pray with you today. I want to lay hands on you today. I want to speak to what's going on on the inside of you. Be so bold in Jesus' name. Can I get some prayer warriors to help me today? Can I get some spirit-filled believers to help me walk around as we sing this song? And we're going to pray for some people to be healed up and set free today. Come on, let's have an encounter with Jesus today. Such a 